Hi, I'm uh, Brad Roven. I'm the Chief of Nephrology at Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, and I am currently attending the American Society of Nephrology meeting um, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm heavily involved in uh, glomerular disease research, both at the uh, translational level in my laboratory, as well as in conducting and designing and interpreting clinical trials. Um, I've been involved also with uh, writing guidelines, and I'm now co-chair of the uh, KDGO uh, Glomerular Disease Guidelines. In these last several years, uh, we have had uh, major uh, advances in the treatment of several glomerular diseases. So we just finished updating our lupus nephritis guidelines, and we are about to embark on updating the chapter on IJ nephropathy. We have a very uh, nicely defined pathway for clinical trial approach and drug approval through the FDA now. And this has really um, sort of stimulated a lot of activity in the field uh, to bring new drugs forward. Um, we have two uh, drugs that have um, had accelerated approval uh, for IgA. Both of these trials uh, finished their phase three uh, follow-on study uh, looking at um, kidney function uh, after being approved on the basis of, of proteinuria. Uh, and both of these trials were, were successful. The first drug that was approved uh, was Neficon, and it is a uh, enteric uh, glucocorticoid that targets the gut mucosa and the, the gut immune system. And the idea there is that uh, this is where a lot of IgA is produced, and, and in addition, the um, aberrant IgA that deposits in the kidney. And we showed uh, last year that this reduced proteinuria at nine months significantly compared to placebo. And then uh, this year, we wrapped up the trial following the patients over two years, and we showed that there was a definite advantage in kidney function measured by glomerular filtration rate for the patient group that was uh, taking or had been given uh, the NEFCON. There's all sorts of questions left over, so we'll do sub-analyses and try and understand in whom the drug may be most effective, and that's very exciting. The second um, uh, drug is called Sparsentan. This drug um, was more recently uh, uh, approved by the FDA uh, based on its nine-month proteinuria data, which was a decline uh, over a actual active uh, comparator, uh, Herbisartan, of about 40%. Um, we have now finished the uh, trial, uh, and we know that over the next uh, several uh, months, so we took the trial out from nine months to 110 weeks, so a little bit over two years, uh, that proteinuria difference was sustained uh, in the patients on Sparsentan. And then when we examined the uh, GFR uh, over the entire uh, two-year period, uh, we saw that there was a protection in other words, the patients treated with sparsentan uh, actually maintained GFR uh, better than the patients uh, treated with uh, the uh, comparator drug. Um, and this was significantly different after we accounted for the um, initial decline in GFR, which we expect uh, based on the mechanism of action of sparsentan. So both of these drugs will now uh, go forward, uh, hopefully, uh, to see if, if they will uh, achieve full approval uh, by the regulatory authorities. So uh, a very exciting time in IGA. The reality is that these were not the only two uh, uh, drugs that are being tested in IGA. Um, and we have a, a whole bunch of drugs now uh, and they're in various stages of development, but a lot of positive data at the ASN uh, looking at uh, targeting the complement system in patients with IgA nephropathy, which is very exciting, and then also drugs that are targeting uh, B cells, uh, and B cells, of course, eventually lead to plasma cells that make antibodies that are involved in IgA nephropathy. So uh, I, I think that... Um, 
KDGO really has its work cut out for it because literally at our last uh, um, um, version of the guideline, there were no drugs approved for IG nephropathy. And all we actually had was to potentially use or make a decision whether to use systemic glucocorticoids um, at high dose or more modest dose. But that was really um, what we had uh, to our disposal. On top of that, there's been a lot of work outside of simply looking at therapeutics of IJ. But I think one of the important things the guideline is going to have to do is assess the data out there that now suggests that what we had normally considered our goal, which uh, for patients uh, treated for IJ nephropathy, to get their proteinuria down to a gram a day may not be sufficient. We may actually have to target uh, getting patients to as low as we possibly can in terms of their proteinuria. And to me, that really is going to entail probably using these new medications in combinations, which is very exciting. And they haven't been tested that way, but I don't think any drug on its own is going to necessarily get the patient to the point where we feel 100% confident that we're going to prevent uh, the need for renal replacement therapy during their lifetime. So a lot of exciting uh, work, and my guess is that we're going to update the guideline, uh, the, the chapter for IJ uh, soon in the next uh, coming months. And then uh, probably in the next year or two, uh, we'll have to revisit this because the field is moving forward so quickly.